And tell us a bit more about the self-defense aspects of Savant and what do you do in there? So it, Défense dans la rue or self-defense in the street that has existed inside Savat for a very long time. And what generally you're doing is attempting to use your opponent's momentum against them so that you can weaponize the environment, throw them into a bar, make them trip over something into the street, or else you're doing something like dislocating an elbow, using shoulder, elbow, knee, anything that will get them into a position where you can walk away from the fight, preferably without looking like you were actually fighting and brawling. Because the other side of the story, anytime you have an encounter in the street is, you then have to explain that to Officer Friendly. And if Officer Friendly thinks you were both fighting because you were both being jerks and you just happened to be the one who won, you're still going to spend the night in jail. And no one wants to spend the night in jail because some other jerk came up to them and attacked them. And this was a very serious concern in late 19th and early 20th century Paris, where you had a lot of street crime going on. So mm -hmm. there were a lot of techniques developed for using everyday things that you happen to have with you, how to use your coat, how to use your sleeve if you had a heavy coat, manchette techniques. If you were a French policeman and you had, a, you had heavy gloves with thick, heavy leather cuffs, you might use the same thing to strike or to block with. And uh, do you have uh, different uh, schools and styles in Savat? Yes. Okay. So the family tree I learned in looks more like a family bush. And there are a lot of commonalities and it's more a case of, okay, we get this from these people and we get these from those people. Um, Maurice Sari was sort of keeping Savat alive after World War I and World War II, but there were other family methods. Um, one of the big ones being the Lafon family who have a very different set of techniques. They've kept the open hand techniques and basically rejected the closed fist striking. And they're still well known in France, for example. Uh, why this did they, lineage I learned under. Why did they reject the closed fist? Because of injury? They really preferred sort of older school methods where they consider the open hand superior to the fist. Okay. Particularly if you have to strike at hard targets. Okay. Interesting. The family lineage I learned under has relatively little contact with 20th century French competitors. There's some around here and there. It preserved a lot of older stuff, such as those knife techniques I've referred you to. I would not be at all surprised if there were two or three other families just sort of doing their thing who hadn't come to major international attention. But there's always a question of what the prescribed federations will do, because if you're gonna have a sport, you have to agree on your common rules, right? and what some smaller family group will be doing. So one of the bigger lineages, if you're not doing mainstream box Francaise, would be the, the, the Lafond family of martial arts. And what and is they this? Do a, they do a lot of work with the subset of what we, we would call in Savat, a subset of Savat called panache. Lots of open-handed techniques, lots of elbow, also preserving cane use. Okay. Um. Going back to, okay, thank you very much. Was very, and you, you also practice grappling in your system? Yes, although we do not do it the way that a judo player would. For a saboteur, the idea of grappling is to control the opponent so you can destroy their structure or to throw them. Or if God help you, you wind up getting on the ground using your leverage and your body weight so that you can get back up on your feet as quickly as possible. For the most part, we do not want to be in a very long-term grappling situation. We use it as a control and to get in and to get out. Which the new generation of MMA shows us when you know grappling, everyone wants to get up as soon as possible. Just the, MMA, the new generation of MMA striking. No one goes to the ground because they're all wrestlers and BJJ, so they don't go to the ground because now you can sit in someone's guard and punch him. In the past, no one knew what to do, but now mm -hmm. everyone knows. So then everyone wants to get up again, right? It's very yes. interesting to see the development. Very interesting because then it, again, it shows to me being, as you know, being a wrestler in Kyokushin as a striker and as a wrestler, I fully understand you. Today, you know, if you ask me, I also want to, don't want to go to the ground. Although, as you know, I know how to grapple mm -hmm. on the ground. But once yeah. strikes are there and the guy knows what he's doing, how to 
neutralize your ground techniques, the best is always to get up. So this again shows that the, the Savat, right? It, it, this is a very good idea. Very yeah, nice. You have to know how to wrestle. You have to know what to do if someone does an entry onto you. You have to know how to sprawl all those basic things, but it's not prioritized. It's an, oh, this has to happen. Or I can use this to set up a control or a throw. Yeah. A lot of self-defense savada is designed to do that, especially if you can do it in a way where it looks accidental because you don't want to go to jail because someone else attacked you. No. That's a terrible way to go through life. That's right. Absolutely. And uh, another thing regarding back to the weapon system, Hungarian mm -hmm. and Georgian system, you learn uh, besides sword in that system, what uh, do you use other weapons? The Hungarian system is sword and axe, axe and, yes. we'll, and we'll play around with other stuff but they're not emphasized. For example, my mentor and I were both medieval scholars and there's always been a lot of interest in archery in Hungary. So, I mean, you could, if you look back on the back wall, you'll see I've got the bows hanging up on the bow yes. case. So we do a lot of archery, but that's not because of the lineage. That's just culturally archery is, it tends to be interesting to Hungarians the same way it is to Persians. Yes. What type of archery technique do you use? Thumb draw or Mediterranean draw? Uh, neither. I would use what people tend to call Sasanian. So mm -hmm. I'll have the arrow here and it, I'm still off the same side of the bow as you guys are, but I'll have the string here and the arrow here and I'll draw, draw here. Sasanian. Difference at least as I learned is that we, I use an open draw rather than a to the body draw. Yes. And that's just an accident of how I learned it with myself and Chaba often shooting while wearing helmets. We wound up sh having a knock point that was in the air rather than on the body. Yeah. So, nice. and after a short time of shooting that way, I find that I cannot go back to the Mediterranean draw. It feels very clumsy to me now. <laughs> the re the re I, can, I can do thumb draw. I can do one finger lock. I can do two or three finger locks and all the different versions of them. But the release is so much cleaner than the Mediterranean draws release. I find now that when I shoot Mediterranean, I have to put the arrow over here. It's terrible. The release is squishy. It's, it's awful. Yes, I know what you, what you want to say. Absolutely. Very I live in a suburban neighborhood where I don't get as much practice as I would like to. So I don't sell myself primarily as an archer. But when I have a chance to get enough space to shoot safely, then friends and I will go somewhere and we'll spend an afternoon drinking tea and shooting arrows. Okay. Do you also have an armor? Do you practice fighting in armor? I have an armor. I fight armored when I have the chance to. When I was in Hungary, that was much more often. Now, there are people around me who do armored fighting on a very regular basis. Family life for me means that I do it less often. Sometimes I'll fight in mail. Sometimes I'll fight in the brigandine. A combination of things. Sometimes just a buff coat, very thick, heavy leather. It all affects your movement in different ways. And because I'm primarily a medieval scholar who did lots of experimental archeology, span the ways it forces you to move differently is very interesting to me. Absolutely, absolutely. What kind of armor do you have? So I have a brigandine of the late 14th century style and I have several male shirts. I have a heavy buff coat and I have different forms of fabric armor. All I European. have some limb defenses, say. All European? Or not a all European. I have one. It's not here. I could pull it out to show you. I also have one Jazzerant with mail inside. Really? Who made yes. it for you? I made it. I, I tailored it. I tailored the mail inside the leather and cloth overcoat. Can you show it to us, please? I, like I said, I don't have it here or I would. Oh, you don't have it. I thought it's here. Oh, it's there. Yeah. Okay, so I have, okay. so I have the, I have, you know, the male lined caftan that you see in so many miniatures. And I'm convinced that was also used by many of the steppe peoples who were shown in Hungary, because you'll see picture after picture after picture of these guys running around with helmets and mail and mail peeking at their sleeves. But then you have caftans and coats over top of it. For certain, it was a jazzerant. Yeah, yeah, certain. That's what we we, we we had videos on this channel and we talked about the same thing, that they were jazzing. Mm -hmm. You don't have a helmet and bazoo band and then you just wear them in normal. Yeah, it would be madness. <laughs> madness. Why are you doing that, right? Absolutely. Exactly. 
It's the same, you know, we, we also, or we completely agree with you. We just made a video on, with our uh, scholar friend, Beat on that. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, this, another, okay, this was also about that. It's this one, this, okay, let's go to the last point of our, uh, do you also have a value system in your uh, system of teaching, like martial arts values and principles, things like that? I have a value system that I teach with. The saber is a military lineage. It's a military lineage from the 19th and 20th century. It, it puts a high prestige on control of your weapon, honoring your opponent. Even if you had to fight a duel, that was still a duel. It wasn't murder in the streets. There were codes of honor that dictated how you could fight the way you fought. For example, many Hungarian duels were fought with the point but if it was for a less serious situation, the point was explicitly forbidden. And you could wind up dueling someone in a situation where only cuts were allowed because you had a conflict that had degenerated to the point where honor had to be satisfied, but everyone agreed that this was not worth taking a life over. Yeah. And so it became sort of the equivalent to the friendlier versions of fights where you may have had them growing up, where you and someone else wound up fighting and neither one of you needed to kill each other, but there was some point that had to be made. Even if it was only, is this person tough enough that they're actually walking their talk? Yes. Very similar to that. So the general point is to act honorably and to act honestly at all times. Yes. Savat can be a little bit more complicated. I don't teach Savat morality because a lot of it came from lower classes where trickery was explicitly encouraged. Malicia and dirty tricks that got you home safely were prioritized over fighting honorably because in many cases, this was a person who's learning to protect themselves when they're attacked. The, the fundamental assumption is that their attacker was not honorable was attacking them for personal gain or robbery and would happily leave them lying in a ditch. And so the emphasis was do what you do that gets you home safely with nobody hurt more than they need to be. I don't teach that personally. I tend to teach the more straight up versions. And because I teach a lot of body mechanics and how to get yourself able to move better. I mean, I move pretty well for a guy who used to need an extra half hour to get in and out of the car and many of my students are much older, I put a strong emphasis on making sure you are fully in control of yourself before you do any techniques with anyone else. The worst training injuries I got were never in competition or a ring. They were always cases of practicing techniques with people when the person involved wasn't paying close enough attention. So I put a real emphasis on care for your opponent and control yourself. I mean, regarding self-defense, that's what I also, you know, as you know, I have uh, people who are head of police or also they were military in engagement or interviewed them on this channel mm -hmm. and also teach police and these things. And you know, I always say also, you know, I was talking to one of our colleagues, you know, in self-defense. This is this. There are two different types of self-defense, so at least at least one self-defense is. You go get an engagement, be the street fight. No one wants to kill the other. It's like a mm -hmm. MMA, right? But not right. sanctioned MMA. Let's put it that way, right? Right. But another one, like, is, okay, like a killer, like an, you know, a dangerous person wants to rob and kill you and attacks you. That's completely a different self-defense situation. Yes. And I think, I think most of our colleagues and now, look, I come from very tough martial arts. You know that we met each other in the Oh, years. yes. We know we teach for that type of self-defense where two guys have not unsanctioned MMA bouts, right? Mm -hmm. right. That's what we teach. That's the, that's the self-defense we teach. Very tough, very tough. But we still assume these guys are honored people, right? And then, yes. then it's finished. But their self-defense, that type of self-defense is useful for guys who are younger, you know, for example, when you get older, you don't get into those fights anymore. Also, <laughs> no. Unless, unless something is wrong, you know, you get in high school, when you are young, or maybe in the beginning of your college years, but not later, right? No. Or maybe, maybe later when you are young, you are driving, a crazy guy comes, you just do it, some fist throwing, maybe. 
And then right. afterwards, even if you, you hated him before you threw fists at each other, afterwards you're friends and no one can explain why. Yes. Yes. And very different is... than when someone comes out of nowhere with a weapon. And I think we teach mostly that type of self-defense, not this vicious self-defense, let's call it this way, a serial killer, sorry, wants to kill you from behind, right? Mm -hmm. And I think these are, and then when, you know, the more I talk to experienced police officers or head of police officers, you know, like Rich here in, on this channel, or the more I talk to people who were in warfare, and just recent warfare uh, battlefields, you mm -hmm. realize there are two different ways. This, Self-defense, as we talked, not type A and mm -hmm. type B self-defense, which is normally not taught, right? And so right. when once you're in type B self-defense, you know, for example, and I don't, I'm walking on a very thin ice. I'm walking in a very thin ice. Type B self-defense in military or in police is based on the idea, overcompensate the guy. Right. For example, if he draws a knife, shoot him. No, I'm not just saying why, but because if you we concentrate on tape type A, type one self-defense, the idea is why don't you go and try to disarm the guy? You understand? So you know. Because you don't know if he's the kind of nutcase who's sprayed rat poison on his knife before he goes to attack people. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then I came, I have come to this, you know, after talking to so many colleagues and these colleagues and these interviews are very interesting. Also, you are so kind to talk. So it's very useful for all of us, different experts worldwide from different martial arts, because at the end of the day, of all of us, either we want to fight better so these interviews help us or we want to defend ourselves. And that's why I not only interview martial artists, I also interview veterans coming from warfare. I interview mm -hmm. police officers, snipers, because I think this collection of different experiences from our colleagues from different fields help us to understand that there are two types of self-defense. <laughs> and that's why what you said about Savat, these uh, dirty uh, things. And so then it reminded me all of a sudden of these two types of self-defense, Ross. Yeah, it's very different. If I'm in a fight, I'm in a fight. If I'm suddenly in combat, well, if I'm in a fight, my worry is, how do I get home? That's not my worry. My worry is, is this guy going to pound me? Am I going to look like a jerk? All these other things. If I'm in combat, my worry is, do I get to go home? And in the Savat culture, malicia and trickery and anything that lets you get home is the primary value. Very good point. Excellent. I love it. Right. Yeah. I would never do that in a tournament. That would be terrible. Of course. On the street, still terrible. Most of the time, you don't need anything like that. Sometimes you do. And when you do, you need to have at least something in the back of your pocket for it. Yeah, that's right. Um, Ross, uh, one more, uh, no, another, uh, two more questions I have before I forget. The first okay. question is, the first question is about your books. Uh, tell us, because I have one of your books, you kindly mm -hmm. sent it to me, beautiful book. By the way, I'm going to put the link to, uh, uh, to, uh, to his book so you can buy it uh, to Ross's book. It's a very good book. I really, it was, it's very informative. Tell us about your books or DVDs or publications. Please, I'll just give the floor to you. Just talk okay, about so I don't have any DVDs right now. Mm -hmm. My students have now pushed me to the point that first they pushed me to start a club. Now they're going to push me to start a channel soon. So I'll, I'll start putting things in video soon. It doesn't exist yet. But I translate old saber manuals and I describe the lineage of saber fencing, Hussar saber fencing that I learned. So I wrote a book on that and I have translations in the back of it. And one of my questions for myself has been over the years, where does this come from? because the lineage I learned had so many techniques that I instantly recognize from other fencing of the era, but the stance was so very different. And trying to understand the differences led me to translate some of the Austro-Hungarian fencing. And the more of those manuscripts I get accustomed to, the more I see, okay, this was different. They started doing something different over here, but all of these other techniques are exactly the same. So I translated Karoly Lesak's fencing manual. Right now I'm working on Gustav Arlo, who takes Hungarian and Austrian techniques and marries them to Italian techniques. And I also focus on body mechanics in a very big way. Um, inside the book that you referred to, one of the things I was realizing after I'd gotten hurt training Savat was 
that there were a lot of guys who actually had trained harder than me. They trained much harder than me. They didn't advance in rank like I did. It turned out I understood some things mechanically without realizing that I knew it that they didn't. So I wrote a book called Basic Body Mechanics to help people figure out where their bodies were. And along the way, I have expanded that into other daily life things. For example, I even have extended the concept to falling and rolling. There's a book called The Weightless Ribbon, because if you're older, you don't want to learn how to fall by throwing yourself at the floor. You just don't <laughs> heal as quickly. It's not a good way to learn. So I wrote a book on falling and rolling and taught a four-hour seminar on that just last month. And I've taught 12-year-olds to roll. I've taught an 82-year-old woman how to roll. No injury required whatsoever. And I've even extended it out into driving for people who have to lie, drive very, very long distances. Because of course, I'm in Texas and I live in America and a 20 hour drive is something that many of us just do. Yeah. So how do you get out of the car feeling as good as you got into the car if you've driven 15 hours? Yeah, absolutely, it's a big thing. Absolutely. So I tend to focus very strongly on the very basics of what you're doing with yourself. My mentor in the body mechanics side of things had a pithy saying that said, when you know what you're doing, you can do what you want. That's right. And that's sort of what drives me as an instructor. Very good. Thank you very much. And then the last point I just want to ask you, you know, the, this historical HEMA, European martial arts, is based on reviving or, or reconstructing martial arts from books. I have mm -hmm. the feeling that's not what you do, right? You don't do that. I have been a scholar from the historical fencing for better than 20 years. Okay. I mean, I, I have photocopies of the additional manuscript, the Paulus Hector Mayer. I transcribed some Messer fighting. Messer is like a medieval machete or a single single edged swords. I've been doing scholarly work for that for a long time, but it's not my primary fencing focus because I've inherited or become part of three different living lineages and just trying to keep those alive is a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. So I will play with longsword. I play with Messer. I certainly, at one point, it was me and one other person in the Western Hemisphere who had Lekuchner's Messer Fechten, literally. So we transcribed that, released it out to the public. It's, it's there, anyone can look at it. There's a lot of interesting techniques there that are preserved. We have machete techniques from Svat that are exactly the same as the Renaissance Messer techniques. Block the blow, hook with the handle, push, so that you can either kill the guy or restrain the guy and not have to kill him. Very basic technique preserves. So for me, it's interesting seeing the historical sweep even while I focus on the living lineages. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Ross. It was very informative, very good. So you are going to uh, put also the links to for your book so people can come and order from you. And do you want to say something at the end of our discussion? Thank you very much. This is a privilege for me. You and I don't get to see each other anywhere near as often as I'd like to, just because of time and distance. So for me, it's an honor. And if I would say one thing to the channel, it's somewhere near you is some little group of people who doesn't care about money and doesn't care about publicity and they are preserving things that have value and if you happen to find one of those little lineages even if they're not fancy even if they only have three cuts take the time to learn those because they may go away in a generation and leave a whole bunch of people scrambling trying to find out what it was that people were doing so thank you very much i appreciate you Thank you very much and have a nice day, Ross. Beautiful. Thanks. Bye-bye.